today I, I want to start by sharing a little bit of my own entrepreneurial journey with you. Um, so I'll, I'll start by giving a little bit of background. I grew up in Arizona. I was born in Scottsdale, Arizona, which, if you're not familiar with United States geography, is a state that's right next to California. Um, I grew up there with a, a great family, and in particular, a brother who's two years older than me, whose name is Scott. And growing up, Scott and I were probably unlike a lot of other young kids. We didn't really fight a lot, which is unusual for siblings. But Scott and I really developed a, a great friendship. And I think a lot of that came from Scott's attitude towards inclusion of me. What I mean by that was growing up, Scott had a bunch of friends, um, a lot who were primarily guys, who would come over and play video games. And I, being the little sister, um, looking up to Scott, was like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing hanging out with your friends? What are you playing? And Scott was really always excited to bring me into the conversation. And he was like, hey, you should come play video games with us, too. His attitude was always, three is better than two, so here's a controller. Let's go. Let's go play. And it was through that love of technology, through that love of playing games uh, growing up that got me really interested in technology in general and the tech scene. And as I started growing up playing these games, Scott and I started bouncing ideas off of each other. We started saying, how cool would it be if we could create our own video game? Right? I thought it was really interesting, this concept that online you could build this entire world from literally nothing that people love interacting with, they love playing with, um, that you could build an experience for people. And that was kind of a, a very interesting concept to me. And as Scott and I were bouncing these ideas off of each other, we said, all right, like, how do we build a video game? What do we have to do? What are the steps to getting there? And we started Googling, and we realized, you've got to learn how to code. So we started digging in. We started playing around with HTML and CSS and JavaScript and then PHP and MySQL and all these other programming languages. And the more that we dived into learning how to program, the more I realized that it's extremely hard to build a video game. <laughs> so I decided, all right, rather than building a video game, we're going to take this one step easier. Let's do stepping stones. Um, let's just build web pages for people. And my parents had a bunch of family friends who were running businesses who were like, hey, we, need a, we just need a website for our business. Could you build us something? And that's really how, how we started off in technology. Scott and I would sit down and we would build these websites for our parents, family, friends, um, and get paid a little bit of money to do that. And one day Scott and I started talking and we were like, hey, you know, this is great that we're building these websites for other people, but what about building something that solves a problem for us? And at the time, I was a person that for the life of me, could not remember usernames and passwords. I don't know if you're like me, but just I was clicking forgot password on every single website that I was visiting. And so we were like, all right, let's just go build something that allows people to store all their usernames and passwords and put all those usernames and passwords in one site and then log into everything with just one username and password. That was the idea. So Scott and I went to our parents because I was about ready to graduate from high school. And we said, rather than getting internships between my high school year and, and college, uh, we want to go build this website that allows people to store all their usernames and passwords and log into everything with one username and password. And my parents are fantastic people, but the one word that I'll use to describe them is they're a little bit traditional. So to them, the idea that rather than going to get an internship and rather than starting on our professional career, um, we were going to go start this technology company was a little bit out of the realm of possibility or out of what my parents really wanted us to do. So as we were presenting this idea to my dad, my dad came back to us and said, if you want to learn how to run your own business, one of those lessons is financial responsibility. So you need to move out of the house and learn how to be financially independent. 
So at 18 years old, I pack up my bags. My brother packs up his bags. We put them in the trunk of a car, and we drove to South Central Los Angeles. Again, if you're not familiar with, with uh, American geography, South Central Los Angeles is not really the place that you want to be living as, as a young person, or maybe just in general. But at the time, it was a place that we knew we could get cheap rent. So the math in our head said we had a certain amount of savings from these websites that we had built. And we had three months in the summer before I went off to college and my brother went back to college. So we said, three months, we've got this certain amount of money. We can rent out this two-bedroom apartment and rent out one of the other rooms to someone else and we can live in the one room together and we can afford that for three months. So we moved out to South Central. And while we were there, my brother and I spent a lot of our days working on building the first prototype of my social cloud. It started off very, very simply. It started off with a pen and a piece of paper where we were literally drawing out what we wanted our website to look like. Then we took that and built out the front end to it, so built out um, what you can see through, through the computer screen and started coding that. Then we started attaching a back end to it so that people could actually come in, create an account, we would store that data, and then we would store all their usernames and passwords. And as we were starting to look at the database of what accounts and URLs people were storing usernames and passwords for, uh, we started realizing that some people were starting to put their bank account information on my social cloud. And we had a little bit of a wake-up call because we started realizing that if people are storing their bank account information on our site, uh, then our site needed to be secure. <laughs> so we reached out to one of my brother's friends, whose name was Shiv Prakash, and Shiv had just graduated uh, his master's from University of Southern California at the time in security. And we reached out to Shiv and we said, hey, we know that you've got a, a pending offer to go work at Twitter, but uh, we'd love for you to come for just a few months and, and work on this project with us. And Shiv, somehow we convinced him. It was a great idea. People were using it that, that he should come and be a third co-founder with us. So Shiv joined the team that summer. And then it was the three of us working on making the site more secure, making tweaks, based off of customer feedback that we were getting and continuing to, to grow users and share the story of my social cloud with other people to try and get people on the site. And as I was sharing my social cloud with other people, a lot of this was done through social media. And one day I had posted a tweet about us on Twitter and then just browsed a little bit on my feed. And I saw a tweet come through my feed and, and the tweet was from Richard Branson. It was just out in the open, but appeared in, my, appeared in my feed. And how many people, by show of hands, know who Richard Branson is? OK. So most people. But for those who don't know, Richard Branson started something called the Virgin Group. So if you've heard of Virgin Records, Virgin Radio, Virgin Trains, uh, Virgin America, Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Galactic going to space, he started all these companies. And the tweet that I saw in my feed from him said, come meet me in Miami for intimate cocktails, donate $2,000 to charity, and then it gave an email address. And I immediately took that email address and I put it into Google and I said, hi, my name is Stacy Ferreira. I am 18 years old, so I am not legally old enough to drink cocktails in the United States, but I'd love to come meet you and learn about how you grew your businesses. And by the way, I'd love to bring my brother as well. We got an email back that night from his secretary, and she said, great. If you both can donate $2,000 a piece, so if you can donate $4,000 and be in Miami in 48 hours, then you can meet with him. Now let, re let me remind you that we were broke college kids at the time. Our parents had said, you have to move out of the house and be financially independent. And again, if you're not familiar with United States geography, California is over here, 
and Miami, Florida is all the way on the other side of the country. And we had 48 hours. So I did the only thing that I could think of to do at the time, which was pick up the phone and call my dad. And I was like, hey, dad, um, remember, this is 2011. So I was like, I know that you don't know what Twitter is. However, there's this amazing opportunity to go meet Richard Branson, and I need to borrow $4,000 to do it. My dad, being the businessman that he is on the other end of the phone, says, Stacy, write me a proposal. Why do you need this money? Where is the money going? And most importantly, I want to see that Excel spreadsheet with that payment plan of how you're going to pay me back. So my brother and I stay up all night, clocks ticking down, writing up this proposal, and we send it off to my dad. And in the morning, my dad gives me a call, and he says, here's the deal. Lesson in money management. I will loan you the $4,000 if you decide that you want to take the loan with the one requirement that you pay me back in three months. So it was by the time, Stacy, that you step foot on college campus, you have to pay me back. And I said, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm going to do it. So took the money, donated it, and flew to Miami. We got to meet with Branson over the course of two nights. And the first night was a room that was probably, I don't even know, like the fourth row back and then up. It was a fairly small room. And one of the things that stuck out to me that night when we were there meeting with him was that it was an extremely small room. So I went up to his secretary and I said, you know, how many opportunities did you give to people based off of this tweet to, to come and meet Branson? And she said, we had 25 opportunities. And the thing that was fascinating to me was that I was going around counting the number of people in the room and there were only 18 of us. And I asked her, why? why? Why would something like this not be 100% full? Like, who would not want to meet Richard Branson? And she said, you know, we have opportunities like this fairly often, but a lot of people don't take the risk. And I kind of took a step back, and I, I can identify with that, right? $4,000 is a lot of money, and just to have that laying around is extremely tough. To be able to fly to Miami on moment's notice, also an extremely tough thing. But the thing that was instilled in me as a young individual growing up was that education is so important. Learning from people who have been there, done that, you cannot put a price tag on it. And I saw it as an educational opportunity to go meet and learn from someone who had done something incredible who had the confidence in themselves to make it happen, not just once, not just twice, but multiple times. There was no price tag on that. So going back to that night, it was a room of, of us, 18 people, and my brother and I really had one objective for that night, and it was we wanted to get Richard Branson's email address. The reason why, again, goes back to this idea of learning. It was one thing to be in the room with him for that one night, but we knew that it would be another thing to be able to connect with him and build a relationship over time. And we wanted to make sure that we had the right tool, his email address, to be able to keep that relationship going. So that was the objective, get his email address. And that night we went around the room and everyone talked about who they were, where they were from, why they were there, what what projects they were working on. And after that, my brother and I went straight up to him and we said, can we have your email? Your personal email, not the one that goes through your secretary. And he wrote it down on a piece of paper and handed it to us. 
And then just to validate, I'll never forget my brother. <laughs> he went over to the secretary and he was like, is this, is this really his email address? And she was like, yeah, that is, so keep it close. And from there, we left Miami even more motivated than before. Flew back to Los Angeles and continued working on making the product that we were building better and continuing to get our first customers on the system. And at that time, we were really marketing my social cloud as something that was a consumer product, something for each and every one of you in this room to be able to go, store all your usernames and passwords, and log in. But the way that we were reaching our target audience was, was fairly simple. Again, not having a budget, it was reaching out to family and friends, posting on things like Facebook and Twitter about what we were doing, keeping people updated. So we had a lot of questions around how we could really grow this. What are good channels for customer acquisition? So we sent Branson an email and we said, you know, we'd love your advice. What do you think our go-to-market strategy should be? How do you think that we should go about getting our next set of customers beyond just our ecosystem? And again, this was 2011, so he came back with an email that said, hey, this sounds great, but I don't do a ton in technology right now. Why don't you go talk to my friend Jerry Murdoch? And Jerry Murdoch started something called Insight Venture Partners, which is a venture capital firm. And very quickly, I'll make the distinction for people that might not know what, what venture capital or VC is. Venture capital, um, Jerry runs a firm that takes um, money from endowments, from wealthy individuals, and then invests that money in startups to help them grow. And Jerry got on a plane and flew out to South Central LA to meet with my brother, Shiv, and I, and drilled us the entire day on our business. What is your business? How do you keep this thing secure? How many users do you have today? What's your growth rate, growth trajectory? How are you planning to go to market? Stacy, what are you doing? You're 18 years old. Why are you not in college right now? All these questions. And we spent the entire day with him answering them. And that night, we went out to dinner. And at dinner, Jerry said, here's the deal. He said, I got a chance to talk to Branson. I got a chance to talk to our friend Alex Welch, who founded and sold a company called Photo Bucket. And the three of us would like to come in and invest $1.2 million in your business. And at the time, at 18 years old, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. But this is awesome. So we worked on the, the terms of the deal and them investing that money. We gave up equity in our business. We gave up percentage points of ownership and, and took the deal. And I'll kind of fast forward a little bit, make a long story short, but that really kick-started my own entrepreneurial journey. It took what was an idea onto a piece of paper, building it into that product, getting our first customers, and then the investment to really catalyze what we were doing to grow it to that next stage. And at that point, that really kick-started that journey and, and propelled us into this different world. We continued to grow that business over the course of two years, and we had a lot of big decisions to make. What's typical when you're running a kind of high-tech, high-growth startup is that a lot of times after you raise your seed round of financing, you'll go on and raise what's called a, a Series A, your next round of financing, to continue fueling the growth behind your business, continue reinvesting to be able to create more growth. And the decision that we had at that point was, was twofold. The first thing that we had identified about our target customer segment was that while selling to the individual was great, it was a really hard business model. Because as individuals, a lot of us, unfortunately, as we found, don't necessarily care about our privacy day to day. But the thing that we identified was that a lot of big businesses, enterprise companies, do care and also have the budget to go along with that. 
So one of the things in the back of our mind was thinking, how can, we, how can we move this product more into the enterprise segment? How can we get larger companies onboarded to this software who will in turn bill more from a rev revenue perspective so that we can continue to grow on our own without the investment? So that was kind of a, a thought in the back of our mind. And our second thought was that we, again, are running this company that allows people to store usernames and passwords and sign on to things uh, kind of in the, we call it the SSO space, the single sign-on space. But what happens if someone were to hack into our systems? We had a very small team, and while $1.2 million seems like a lot of money, it's not a lot of money when you think about the number of people out there who are trying to get access to information. So we had a lot of big decisions to make. Do we want to go the route of raising our Series A and continuing to fight that battle? Or do we want to join up with a company that maybe has a lot more resources than us, that already has enterprise customers that we can sell into and partner with to really make this thing bigger and better than we can at this stage? We had a few acquisition offers on the table, but in 2013, we ultimately chose to sell my social cloud to a company called Reputation.com out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I, along with our other team members, went to work at Reputation.com for a little while. And while I was there, I had a realization. And that realization was that we did the right thing for the product and for the customers by merging our company with Reputation. However, for myself personally, I found myself sitting in a cubicle working 9 to 5 at 20 years old for someone else's dream. And that was something that ate away at me for a while before I decided to take the leap out and decide to leave Reputation. The thing at that point that was really interesting to me was what do people choose to do with their life? At that point in time, I was 20 years old, had just sold my first business, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And as I started thinking about that, other people were coming and bombarding me with questions. People were saying, you're a role model for the next generation. What's your next company that you're working on? I had my mom on one end being like, don't you know that girls meet their significant other in college? You need to go back to college. And then my dad saying, you need to think about your career and what's next. And if this is not the place that you want to be, then you need to figure that out sooner rather than later. And as all these questions were coming in, I was like, man, this is a lot of pressure. How are other people dealing with this that are my age? So I teamed up with a friend of mine named Jared Kleiner, and the two of us had a mission to go and talk to young people all across the globe, hear their stories and learn the lessons around projects that they've built and how they've come up with ideas and brought those things to fruition really in, a, in an exercise to help learn about how we should pursue our futures. And in publishing that book, the thing that was amazing to me was the idea that while my story was, was different and unique in some ways, there are hundreds of other people, not just in the United States, but across the globe who have stories very, very similar to mine. People who were not afraid to have an idea, voice that opinion, take a risk, and make it happen. And the thing that touched me even more was that for every success that I saw, I also saw people who did not have a success the first time around, but who stood back up and tried, tried, tried again, and made it happen later on down the road. And that, to me, was super inspiring. In sharing those journeys, I, I became friends with a girl who we highlighted in the book whose name is Paige McKenzie. And Paige stood out to me because she's my same age. And when I had first met her when I was working on the book, I distinctly remember her telling me, I'm going to start a YouTube channel, and I'm never going to work in an office. And I guess I have a little bit of my parents in me in that I was traditional and thinking, how are you going to make a living off of YouTube? Like, let's be real here. 
And the more that I got to know her, the more determined she became. Fast forward a few years to where we are today, she's been a massive source of inspiration for me simply because she did go out to build that YouTube channel, growing over 300,000 subscribers, in just four years has gotten three book deals off of it, and is starting a television series based off of her YouTube channel. And that caused me to rethink things. I was like, who am I to say that the only way to make a living today is to sit behind a computer in an office working on something else for someone else? And I started looking at that as a theme, right? How is our generation choosing where we put our time and where we invest our time? How do we choose what we want to do in life and what, what work we want to do, what ideas we want to contribute to? And I realized that, that that world of work is really changing. I kind of took a step back and looked at a macro view and realized that, you know, you go back and you go back to pre-1800s and even early 1800s and people were, we were in an agricultural age. People were working the land and that's how people primarily made a living kind of fast forward from that and these rural communities moved into larger cities where we created factories and we moved into the industrial age, all about efficiency and, and working together in those factories. And then you move forward even past that into what you could arguably say we're in today, which is the information age or the knowledge age where the primary way that most people work today is, is in an office, right? Or working with our technology to, to further our economies. And my view is that we're still changing, right? As the world evolves, as technology evolves, we're still changing, we're still growing. And I think that the next age is an age of creativity, an age of entrepreneurship, an age where you truly can go out and be your own boss, create your own YouTube channel, start your own company, be a consultant working for yourself, and make a great living doing it. And I was really interested in that, that future of work and what that flexibility looks like, right? I even think for myself today, if I didn't have a computer or if I didn't have a mobile phone, I might not be here in front of you because I am working, right? But I can work remote. And that idea of flexibility of work was really interesting to me. As I was thinking about what work looks like for all of us, people who are fortunate enough to be in an institutional setting, to have a college education, I became really fascinated with people who were not as lucky to have that. What about all the people who are working hourly jobs or service jobs, working in retail and restaurant, and hotels and hospitals? How do these people experience flexibility? And if any of you have worked an hourly job or are working it today, I know I did back in the day, I remember a manager saying, here are the hours that you have to work next week. If you can't work them, find someone to swap a shift with, good luck. Not a lot of flexibility in that model. Especially for the people who are sitting in this room who might be going to college but also trying to work a job or you know, the single mom who's working two part-time jobs to make ends meet but needs that schedule to be flexible so that her schedule doesn't conflict. And the more that I started thinking about that, I realized that that's a real pain point for a lot of people in the world. And as I started formalizing how I wanted to solve that pain point through technology, kind of a thought in the back of my head was, oh boy, here we go again, another startup. I don't know if I'm cut out to do this. And a lot of those thoughts came from places of self-doubt. All of us have it. What if the first startup was a fluke? What if I'm not good enough to do this again? It came from pressure from outside from the parents saying, hey, at your age, you really need to be finishing that college degree. And as I started thinking about it, I realized that education is something that always evolves. Right? There are lots of ways to get an education. One way is within these walls in an institution, and 
and I've done that and loved it. Another way is to go out and, and learn by doing that in the real world, by starting a business. And those things are interchangeable. I did a year at New York University while running my social cloud and then dropped out to work on that full time. While I published the book, went back to New York University, continued to learn more, and that degree actually helped me with writing that book. I thought, once more, I can go and try something and see if it works. So in 2015, dropped out of NYU again to go start Forge, where we're bringing that flexibility to the workforce. I'll kind of fast forward even more to where we are today. We're just a year, a little over a year and a half old. We've grown the team to eight people in San Francisco. We've got mostly an engineering team. Our, enge our team started out very much as an engineering team. And now we've added on two people to help with sales and marketing. And we're continuing to grow market by market. When you think about the Forge product, um, we've got kind of a two-sided marketplace, right? We've got employers who are looking for people to work at their place, and we've got people who want to go work and make some extra money and get paid. So going into each new market, we've got to build both sides of those. So we've launched in three markets to date, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And my hope for the next couple of years is that we'll continue to expand first in the United States, but then eventually coming over to places like Romania and sharing our journey and what we've built with all of you. So I know I want to I wanna leave some time for some Q&A, so I'm going to pause there and we can jump into Q&A if that works. I think every business is different, and I think there's a lot of opportunity all over the place. Um, growing up with technology at a really young age, I think I kind of defaulted that way. So my dad worked at IBM for 25 years when I was growing up. And just by nature of him working at a technology company, he brought home a computer at a really young age, which is why my brain defaults there. That being said, I think that, as I said, there's opportunity all over the place. You can build any kind of business from scratch. We see it all around of us, right? We, we walk out these doors and we see people who have started a restaurant or who have started a retail location, right? Uh, these businesses are all around and it's possible to really do anything that you want to do, whatever makes you happy. Yeah, I think that I think that it's different, right? If I if I had run a, a restaurant business and then I wanted to get into tech, it might be a little bit different. I might have to convince someone a little bit more. <laughs> that being said, um, I think that it's doable. It's possible. Getting investors is is really a sales exercise more than anything else. Can you sell people on an idea that you have? And I think it goes the second way around, right? Like, if I now, having done technology companies, wanted to go to, um, to people who invest in restaurants, they might also say, you're crazy, right? And I might have to convince them that they should give me money to run a restaurant. So I think it goes both ways. Um, I think that it's, it's just a sales exercise. It's, it's hard no matter what. Uh, it's just about, can you push through that? And can you keep that idea alive and keep moving? No. Two more questions. Did you ever have a period of struggling financially? And if so, how did you manage it? Yeah, so I was going to say, so when we start, started my social cloud, my dad told us that we needed to move into the house and learn how to be financially independent. And at the time, I had no more than like $1,500 saved up from building little websites. And that money goes really fast when you're on your own as a young kid, not having any income coming in because you're literally building something from the ground up. And um, there were days where I was eating ramen noodles and eating Doritos, which is kind of disgusting now I think about it, and like all this stuff just because I couldn't afford to go out and 
eat other stuff. I remember my brother and I eating fast food and like splitting a meal together because we didn't have the money to, to go out and get other food. Um, and then I'll, I'll never forget, there was a period even after we raised our first round of financing for the first company, um, we opted not to take salaries very early on so that we could hire on more talent to help us move faster. So my brother and I didn't really take a salary. And I'll never forget, I was back in New York in the first snowfall of the year, and I go and I try and swipe my credit card to buy a jacket because I was from Arizona, so I didn't have like a heavy winter coat. My credit card got declined. And I was like, this is not, this is not good. Um, but I think that that was even more fuel in the fire for me of I want to control my own destiny. I want to be able to build a business, and create the money so that I never have this issue again. Speaking about the destiny and this is the last question, yeah. do you believe that meeting with Jim Branson was luck, was destiny, was something you controlled somehow? I think it was a I think it was a mix of things. So I think that they say sometimes success is when opportunity meets preparation, right? And I think that it was an opportunity. Um, it wasn't. It was maybe lucky in some sense because I was on Twitter at the right time and saw a tweet. That being said, anyone can go on Twitter. Anyone can get tweets from specific people sent to their phone through text message. So there was an aspect of luck to it. Um, that being said, we were also prepared and not afraid to take the risk after that. And I think that's the piece that a lot of people miss. There's opportunity all around us. We don't know who we're sitting next to in any given moment, who we're standing next to in a line to get food, right? There's opportunity all around us. It's just about making those connections and not being afraid to take that risk. Thank you very much.